subjugate, annihilate or exterminate the galaxy in Stellaris, first you need to know what the hell you're doing, before you cause an accidental galactic genocide. And yes, I know you all want to do it, you monsters. Well, regardless of your psychotic life choices, I'ma show you how and what to do. This ultimate beginner's guide took quite some time to put together, so as a thanks, if it helped or at least entertained, maybe you can come and join the patrons supporting this kind of work. All the links down below. Well, the current version is 3. Point, uh, something 4 version. Hopefully the information I present today will stay more relevant than just one week due to how often developers change the game features. Now, in a way, of course, this is one of the things I've been championing for game development, but damn it, how am I supposed to make decent tutorial, paradox? Anyways, all the useful links and timestamps will be down below, so do look them up. Now, let's jump in. We start off with the very first thing you do. Build your own empire with its war crimes. I mean, conscious morals and ethics. Now, I recommend starting by choosing origin. This often sets limitations or requirements for the government and so on and so forth, the other parts, if you will. So, if you wanted to play on a doomed rock for some godforsaken reason, well, all the more power to you. Here, by simply mousing over origins or selecting them, you can see both the positives and the negatives of each. Ultimately, they're supposed to be not really better or worse than any other, just different. But let's just be frank, all of you want to be dominated by the big titty goth empires. And yes, you can actually make those. Yes, there's even a porn mod too, and I made a video about it. Next then is the government page. Here you choose, well, the government. And no, anarchy does not exist. It does not work in real life and propagated really by idiots, honestly. Anyways, here you can choose your stance on aliens, military, economy, and so on. Once more, mousing over or selecting them, you'll see benefits and drawbacks. This also probably is the most important roleplay page, where you get to choose what type of empire you will be. Greeting everyone with open arms or with a dagger in hand. Have focus on military or be vegan. I mean, pass... 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 pass oh gods, I can't finish the word, it's so disgusting. You know what I meant. Nintendo fanboys. I personally love Gestalt Consciousness and Hive Minds as governments. Everyone's united and you don't have the nonsense of having a planet with 200 languages, most of which are an absolute joke. France. <coughs> Anyways, you also got a list of civics to choose from. Again, they are just simply small buffs and modifiers that depending on the chosen ethics and authority will be greyed out. Or not. Then we move on to traits. Here again you can choose from a list of little buffs and nerfs. However, here you can properly focus on specializing your empire onto something, be it science to make a tall style empire with few planets and smaller territory but having increased efficiency, or a wide one with lots of territory but handicapped technology. I actually went into this topic on a separate guide, so do check it out on how to build these types of empires and how they play out. And finally, we move on to the very last function affecting part, name and class tab. Here you get to choose your own name for a planet and system, so you know to choose something really smart. But functionally changing aspect here is your choice of starting world type. Ultimately, the game will always spawn in enough habitable planets around you no matter which one you pick. But if you know what you're playing against, it might be advantageous to choose a specific type of planet, so that opponent has trouble habiting your own planets. And pretty much all else is cosmetic and does not affect the gameplay. Though cosmetics do affect gameplay! Yes, you didn't think that the MX is not gonna talk about microtransactions and how they are bad in paid games? Then you must be new here! I'm gonna beat this dead horse forever! Woo! Or if this is a bit too over your head, well then take one of the pre-made species. They are really well balanced and play off quite nicely without thinking too much about it. Additionally, if you like them, you can even take their template and edit them. Overall, for more specific and detailed info, do check out the best empire build guide I did. It might have some extra wisdom for meta gameplay for the best do's and don'ts. Right then, you made your empire and it's time to start the game. But then, you see another menu that baffles, confuses and probably makes you scared. What all this boss hoggery has to do with you? Boss hoggery? Jesus, now British are colonizing my fucking vocabulary as well! Please, just kill
kill me! First things first, and this is a very simple, annoying point. There are tooltips, uh, that is, hints, explainers, if you just mouse over. The name of the category. I legit did not know that it was there until one of my friends pointed it out. So you know, paradox, what you need to do, right? Anyhow, the important things that you really need to look out for aren't many. Leave everything on default, those settings are fine. First thing you need to look out for is the galaxy size. Well, the reality of Stellaris is that the engine it uses is in-house, meaning that it was cobbled together by two dudes who know how it works and long since don't work there anymore. And the poor interns act like prehistoric hunter-gatherers just to make one button work. Well, okay, I'm exaggerating, of course, but the point is, the game gets really slow, the longer and the larger the galaxy gets. So, don't be surprised when the late game for the largest galaxy, you literally need to wait real time, just to see something happen. I always play on the smallest galaxy, not only because the performance is better, but also because it oddly is harder, in my opinion. Speaking of the difficulty, thanks to the tooltip you can choose whichever one is appropriate for your skill level. Remember, there is no shame in going lower, so just enjoy the game, and don't let some internet wankers tell you that you're wrong for playing on the lowest. And finally, Iron Man mode. This, as the name suggests, enables permadeath and no save mode. Though if you enable it, you will be able to complete achievements for the game. Though contrary to Iron Man mode, being fresh to the game, saving and reloading after fuckups is a great way to learn how and what technologies as well as fleet power work, or how to prevent problems. So again, no shame in save scumming. Alrighty then, you loaded up the game, the galaxy, and now you're ready to rumble, like a PlayStation dildo! Now, before you unpause, and yes, Stellaris has a pause button, so use it often. First, there are a few things that you can do to start the game and not waste your time. The game has a tutorial and you can re-enable it on the options menu. It's not great, but it can help, though this guide you're watching right now is far better if I can say so myself. And also, while you're in the options, I highly recommend you switch to DirectX 11 mode. Yes, this game engine comes from the DirectX 9 age. Despite the fact that by the time this game was released in 2016, DirectX 12 and, more importantly, Vulcan were already out. <coughs> Paradox. <coughs> Now, as you spawn in, you're always given one science, construction, and three military ships. Starting with the science ships, these are used to explore systems and linking threads between them, surveying the system so that you can build and expand your territory later down the line. Basically, this ship is the first one you send anywhere. So then, surveying systems. This must be done before you can expand anywhere, so right-clicking on a different system opens a menu with survey option in it. Like a typical RTS, you can, by shift-clicking, queue up orders, however, right-clicking ain't fun. There is a faster way by selecting your ship, then survey button in the bottom corner, and then you can shift left click and voila, no extra clicks. Now, since the last few versions, like many mods available at the time already for the game, developers finally gave automatic surveying as a standard from the get-go. Enabling this option will tell the ship to go survey any system around it at random. Very good feature for the late game, especially for the bigger galaxies. However, I do not recommend using it at the start of the game, and I'll explain why in a bit. Now, what I do recommend doing first is starting to build two extra science ships at least and sending them out once they're ready to survey different directions. Oh, and the science ships also need scientist leader to function. These, like other leaders, can be purchased for unity. Next are construction ships. These are only used for building outposts and refineries in the system, expanding the territory and making resource gathering buildings. Later, of course, doing a few other things, but that's for the late game. Now, what I recommend doing with these ships is to make them follow science ships and build out the territory as they finish surveying. For this, I usually recommend building another construction ship or two. Personally, I never needed more than two ships overall, but they are cheap and don't need a leader to function. To expand the territory and before you can collect resources from a system, you will will need to build an outpost, which costs alloys and influence. The smartest way to place the Laris is to expand from choke point to choke point until you find an opponent empire. If you manage to block off other empires at the choke point, the more territory you'll have to build out later, without the fear of them jumping across. And it also will be very important for defense later, so find the choke points! 
Oh, and a new addition to these construction ships also is the auto resource building button. Like auto survey, this is a really nice addition and actually quite useful from the word go. Now, as for the military ships, well, as the name implies, they are fighting force. However, until your first war, you really don't need to buy or use them. What you instead can do is strip them for a little bit of alloys. Open the ship designer, untick the auto design box, clear the corvette template, remove the hyperdrive on top, save and then force the upgrade onto the three military ships you have. You gain a little bit of alloy boost from that, good enough for maybe one outpost. So you might as well get it, but it's not that important. Of course, we'll get into fleets a little bit later. But before on pausing, of course, choosing your technologies also is a good idea. With technologies, yes, Stellaris has a big ass tech tree, but you don't also can't see it in game, which is kind of sad. But regardless, basically, you always will be presented with at least three options to choose from. And once that is researched, you get to pick another one. At this point, I won't stress about any of the unlocks or whatnot else. Just pick whatever works for you at the moment. It's pretty much the best and simplest thing to do anyhow. However, there is one specific technology that you should absolutely get as soon as you possibly can. Strikecraft. Take it immediately. Trust me, this will be very important in a little bit. But before we do that, head to your first planet, open up its menu and take a look at the details and get acquainted. Notice that under the quote-unquote features button, there is a tile blocker in specific that will reward you with a pop if you clear it. Most empires come with this and getting this purchased as soon as possible is very important, so remember to do it as well. With the recent updates, also planet automatic building has been turned on and considering that this is a beginner's guide, I can attest that it can actually be about 80% good. You can leave your plants automatically building and managing, but be warned that this may lead to your economy getting into the toilet, as will most automatic systems eventually. But for starters, it's already a useful little thing. Again, the best empire video has some neat information on these subjects as well. But that aside, it's time to... Yes, it's time to let it rip, like the fart that you held on for too long and now has stained your pants. Better yet, you can slow down or speed up the game at will, with the controls at the top right corner. Frankly, I've always played at the top speed, even from day one. I mean, you got the freaking pause button, so what does it matter? Now that the game is going, I might as well explain the basics of each resource. Of course, you can mouse over them and take a look at the details, which is a quite a useful way to see what the most consumption and where it goes. Energy credits, they're basically like money and used for medium for trade, unlocking tile blockers and if you have zero resource in this category, fleets will lose half their power. Minerals, used for building planet districts, buildings, as well as resource stations in systems. Food, well, self-explanatory, if there is a deficit, you're basically a Pol Pot. Consumer goods and its reskins, keeps the pops happy and again, if you don't have enough, you're basically Stalin. Alloys are for building outposts, space stations and ships. Influence is for building outposts and claiming systems for war. Unity is needed to buy leaders, scientists, fleet admirals and getting traditions. And finally, exotic materials are for different boosts in policies, upgrading buildings and technologies. After that, F3 or in the side market opens up the market. Very useful for things when you need something or have too much of something. Policies menu open with F7 has useful buffs if you can afford them. I rarely bother with it myself, but it can be really useful. Though watch out not to screw up your Unity intake. As the game progresses, you will see a lot of random pop-ups. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are returning to early 2000s internet with Stellaris over here. Pop-ups, pop-ups and more pop-ups. Some of these pop-ups even have multiple choices. But seriously though, these events, even if they are bad, can be worse if you ignore them and don't follow up on them. So it's better to pick options that more likely will continue its event. Another pop-up type you'll see a lot is anomalies that science ships discover. These, unlike other pop-ups, can be left alone and researched later. In order to find your opponents, actually, this is the best choice. Oh, and for all the relevant events and their research and progression, always check the status menu by pressing F2. Here you'll also see victory rankings and your relative standing. After a while, thanks to accumulating unity, you will see traditions pop up and you get to choose your first one. These are miniature tech trees, if you will, with even more modifiers and options unlocked when chosen, so take a look and examine each. 
Now, it is recommended that you complete each tradition before starting a new one, as with each time it takes more and more unity to pick the next trait in the tree. But as for what to pick for your first tradition, well, often people say discovery or expansion is a good choice. Usually discovery more because of the survey speed, but expansion on the other hand reduces the outpost cost and improves colonization. And you can always substitute that survey speed with just simply more science ships. However, that in turn costs you unity, and that in turn costs you time for the next tradition unlock. God, this is a good example of game design and how it works. Anyways, at some point you will go into the war. Now, for that, Unyielding Tradition has only one perk that increases defense station power, while all the other perks are... <sighs> Shit. So I never finished this tradition, but for that one perk, it actually is worth it. As for your mid-game tradition, Prosperity is the best one out there. I always pick it as my fourth or fifth one, giving that economy boost and increased efficiency. But speaking of finishing traditions, once you do, you get to pick an ascension perk. These ultimate perks can completely change how your empire functions, like the Becoming Crisis one. So choose wisely, though as always, pick whatever works best at the moment. But speaking of traditions overall, I did a standalone video with a bit more information in it. So do check it out, link down below. Now, after a while, you'll come across a planet that's green, or at least yellow. This indicates suitable colonization environment. Yes, you can get lucky by trying to colonize a red planet that is one below 40% habitability. But that's like asking to make a spa resort on LV426. Basically, you click on a planet you want to colonize. There's a colonize button on top, and from the species list you choose one of them. The game will automatically build a colony ship from the nearest starport with a shipyard and send it there. After colonizing a planet, the topic of planet management once again comes up. Again, the automatic mode is actually a nice beginner-friendly thing. So, you can leave it on, but keep an eye on it. It might sprout legs and gain self-awareness. In order for this system to properly work, you will need to activate the sector economy type. Open up the sector menu and select one of the options. I say balance just works fine, so go with it. Add some resources for the stockpile and hope to space banana gods. This does not end up in planetary revolts. Overall, with planets you can control how much and what economy does it do. I call planet management the dynamic part of economy, while the stuff you get from systems themselves is the static part. When building on planets, remember that priority always goes to pop spawning buildings first. That is, robot assemblies, spawning pools, cloning vats and clinics, and whatnot else might be out there. After that, I usually go for building out districts first, but if economy is going well, you can push out a couple of buildings as well. Now, if you choose to build planets manually, like yours truly often does, then Yamik's rule of thumb is to always have one to two open jobs available on every planet at all times. This ensures that no unemployed pops exist and that available jobs are not crushing your economy by upkeep. So watch out for that when you're conquering new planets, alright? For more information on how to manage planets, I did a dedicated guide. It's on a relatively older version, but regardless, everything still stands just as fine there. Since today I'm going over more surface level stuff to just keep the length down. So I'll refer to my old work. After a while, your science ships will come across some aliens. This is where you will need to use envoys to study and investigate them. Once you investigated said aliens, they will appear in your contacts tab. Aliens that have opinion numbers next to them are active empires and not just single system traders like soldiers or artisans. And here you can start enjoying the good old art of bullshittery. Uh, I mean, diplomacy. With diplomatic and economic moves, you can improve or harm relations. With good relations, it means that the Empire will be more inclined to help or accept deals that you present. Bad relations means that they will declare war on you. Yep, even the pathetic cowards will attempt to kill you with enough hate. Here, you can almost predict which one of them will take on you first. Now, before any of that, as you have found an active Empire, it's time to cut them off at the nearest checkpoint and build a defense station. This is the most crucial part. 
Setting up borders is probably one of the most pivotal points of your empire's history. Generally, you won't have enough economy to build enough military ships to defend properly, so cheapest and best way to survive is the good old defensive wall. So select the choke point system in the node list, open up the system menu and select outpost, upgrade it to give it building slots and more power. This is where the Strikecraft comes in. Throughout the game until the late game, Strikecraft defense stations are incredibly powerful while being also incredibly cheap. Additionally, with unyielding perk I mentioned before, these stations will be the reason you survive and even maybe win the game. Thanks to saves coming, in case the station just cannot repel the first big attack, building additional defense platforms may be helpful as well, but they are costly. But the worst thing that can happen and you must look out for is that opponents can completely bypass the attack range of the station. Yes, enemies can just go around your station and that massive wall may just be a distant lighthouse that shines with intense hatred but does nothing. So picking a good choke point is important, so don't be afraid to sacrifice one or two systems if those are not suitable. So now you're just gonna be waiting, waiting for the war. Or if you're inclined, I guess you can try... <sighs> Diplomacy. <sighs> Alright, well clearly Yemix prefers to greet every living being with a fork stab in an eye and a pitchfork up a kidney, but granted, you can, if you're diligent enough to simp so hard for an empire to convince them to have an intercourse with you. Ah, uh, I mean, in political manner, that is. One example of getting strong or at least preventing attacks is creating a federation. Thanks to the diplomacy tradition and one of its perks, you can invite a friendly empire once you pick it to start one. And when one of you gets attacked, the others are automatically involved as well. And additional fleet sharing also is a great idea. So there are a couple of interesting things if you don't want to go quite uh, explicit on everyone else. Thanks to diplomacy and changes in the subjugation system, you can even convince a stronger empire to become your vassal. Matter of fact, I made a whole guide on how to vassalize the whole galaxy. Though fair bit of warning, it is a sponsored video by Paradox. And the final part of the diplomatic BDSM, there is espionage as well, where you can use your envoys to spy, gather info on your enemy and sabotage even their stations. But if I can be honest here, it's way too much effort than it's worth, or even mentioning the brain space that it requires. Damn it, Jane, I can't feed my people. Do you think I have the time to worry about political lobbying about mandatory cocaine injections? But you know, that's just a MURDER ALL Xenos yummix for you. Oh, and speaking of that, when Jowl Jousting and Yakety Yaks fail, it's time for... WAR! Ah, this is the funnest part of Stellaris. This is when you realize how hard you manage to screw up. Or maybe even succeed on disintegrating the poor little Bobby, the alien species of the galactic history. But to go on a war you will need to know four things. How to manage your ships and fleets. What the hell is the claiming system? How to start and end the war. And why occupying planets with armies is still a gameplay. <laughs> Starting then off with the combat ships. Without your interference, the ship designs are generated automatically and while you can leave it on, it's just not efficient enough. So instead unchecking the auto designs, then clearing the design, pressing the auto best, then saving the design is going to be notably better. It's still lacking, sure, but at least it's way better for at the moment when you make it. Of course you can design your own ships here and it's fairly straightforward menu. So I trust you have a brain and know not to eat crayons. Now, if you open up a fleet management window, you can create or change existing active fleets and by pressing reinforce button, have every available shipyard build all the missing ships and have them automatically go to those fleets they're assigned to all on their own. This menu is highly important to ease up building your troops, alleviating a lot of micromanaging for setting up the forces in the first place. However, once more, I have a dedicated guide for more in-depth information for fleet building. That will give you not only more information, but outright suggestions on what the best builds could be. For example, did you know that Corvettes, the smallest ship in the game, is still good for endgame? Yes, ultimately you can live off of Corvettes only, and that's great. However, apparently there are some murmurs about the changes coming to Stellaris once more that may involve ship combat rebalance paths, so results may vary. <sighs> right, about the claiming system, this method, function, thing is a... Uh... 
game feature, I guess, that needs to be used so that after the war, the systems that you have steamed rolled by force would actually be transferred to you. So what you do is open a war menu or diplomacy screen, then open up the claiming system and here by spending influence you can claim systems. If during the war you defeat the system and control it, after the war ends, the system guarantees that the territory will be transferred to you. Now, there are those so-called total war empires that skip this step completely and immediately take the systems and control them after defeating the hostiles inside it. And yes, you guessed it, from my mad ramblings, this is my favorite type of play, even if it is notably harder than everything else. But how do you start the festivities? Uh, I mean, war. Well, unless you're playing Unique Empire, most of them can declare war at any time for any given reasons that are listed and unlocked, if you've met conditions. Simple as that. Usually you first claim a couple of systems, then declare war, but it can be left for the very last moment. Just don't forget to claim them. Now, as for ending the war, well, there are one of the three ways you can reach it. You or your opponent surrenders giving up the territory claim. You defeat your enemy completely, conquering and occupying enough territory that you can achieve the war goal. Or both of you are exhausted at 100%, and after the last one of you got exhausted, reaching the time limit, the game forces a stalemate, or suing for peace. And the conquered systems are divvied up, according to who conquered what. And speaking of occupation, the fucking armies. Right, to take over the planet and finish conquering a system with inhabited planet in it, you will have to do the following things. Go to a colonized planet you got, open up the armies tab and start recruiting. These non-combat vessels will need to be transported to the system where the planet you want to occupy exists. Then right click land on it. If these armies are strong enough, they will eventually beat and take over the planet and it's now yours. This gameplay is archaic, I hate it, and the fact that it's possibly the longest unchanged feature of the game makes me feel like I'm on the throne turtling and I just can't pinch it off. Damn you, paradox! Look at this horrible anal you made me make! Still, for more information on war details, also check out my general guide for war. And that's it! This basically covers 90% of the game and things you need to do in it. It's daunting, I know, but take it slow, screw around, save scum, do your heart's content. However, that's not the end of the game, obviously. Eventually, you'll come to the mid-game, and even then later on for end-game crises. These are special galactic events that, for the most part, are just spawning incredibly powerful enemies that are coming to get ya. Now, mid-game crisis tends to be quite a bit tamer than the end game for obvious reasons, but even this, if not prepared well for, kicks your ass hard. However, defeating it will offer you some great boons. As for the end game crisis, well, to finish up the game, if you haven't already, the game just plops an extinction level beast of an empire, so that you and whoever is left alive still has a chance to output all of your energy and have a good old brawl. But then finally, how do you win a game of Stellaris in the first place? Ultimately, there are several ways of reaching the end game. First is by losing, obviously. Another one is by killing everyone. And this is my personal favorite, you know, because MURDER! Then, of course, there are additional victory conditions that once met, your empire technically has won. Oh, and one more. The time runs out and Endgame Crisis hasn't managed to kill everyone either. And that's it. That's the ultimate beginner's guide. Yes, I know I put a lot of my references to my older work as well in here, but without it, th this would be just mega uber super video thing. So let's be frank, no one has patience for that to watch. If not for that, then at least for my grading voice at least. So, if you enjoyed the guide or found something informative about it, well, maybe you want to say thanks for putting together this mega thing. And if so, do check out the Patreon and consider becoming one. Hey, a dollar or two will still get me a bunch of potatoes and that will keep me working. <laughs> Same goes with YouTube members and Streamlabs and so on and so forth. Now, of course, if you do have any questions, uh, join the community. The link for the Discord server is well down below. But for now, that's about it. Murder on, my murder hobos! It's a good galactic murder time!